for our last towering podiums of this fiscal year. And generally, what we're doing is uh, coordinating these again. We'll have one in June, uh, likely have one in October, and then probably next year in March. It seems like those are pretty good timelines, although Kevin probably doesn't work out with you guys because you're doing so much at this time of year. So it's good to have you here. Good. <laughs> um, just like to thank Candace Druin uh, for helping to manage and put all of this on. If we didn't have Candace sort of leading this project, we wouldn't have these. So uh, Candace, thank you very much. It uh, certainly helps me out quite a bit uh, in, in getting these together. And um, also, I mean, we're trying to really run these in centralized locations. We, we've had them before in Richmond. Uh, Seems like 40 works out pretty well, but we'll get some feedback from you guys as far as uh, location and things like that afterwards. So today we're talking about uh, powering progression through data solutions. We've got some great speakers coming up. When you went on the website, you would have seen the purpose and a few questions that are perhaps going to make you think about what you do with data in your sport. Okay, and this will be a test because I'm not going to read the slide. You can. Uh, because what I'm more interested in is actually moving to this slide, which is uh, what are you doing currently? Um, so the great opportunity about these events for me is really meeting other people that you may know from different sports and getting together. Some of you may work fairly closely together, uh, but I'd like you to form some small groups, maybe three people per group. Uh, meet the other person that is not in your sport and talk about this question. What data do you collect or track? And afterwards, I'm going to get you to provide some examples, but you may consider those sub-questions. Why are you tracking it and how are you using it? All right, so where you go, meet somebody different. You can go twos or threes. That means all the people from BC Wheelchair Sports have to move. Right, no, yeah, they're like, well, we, why are we tracking it? Because Kevin... fitness uh, test um, and then somebody else will say something else. So, um, Toby, what do you guys collect? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mark or What sport? Sure. Absolutely. Name and sport. 
Mark? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Now, Rob, I'm coming back to you. Anything else you guys are tracking? Kevin, you guys tracking anything yet? Oh, it's a joke. <laughs> uh, going down to J. Notational analysis. Great. Yeah. Similar. Wheelchair rugby. Good. And thanks for bringing those ones up because some of those areas are a little bit harder to maybe track. Any others at the back that you want to add in? Good. Yeah, and I've kind of broken it up here. You know, the some of the initial ones seem to be more around uh, benchmarking data. Um, so, you know, where are my athletes in sort of the outcome? So, are the benchmarks improving? So, bigger outcome type of measures, <clears throat> which could be related to competition. And then this side, I've kind of maybe put those on the key performance indicators. So what what are the indicators that, that help you to understand the benchmark? So maybe more of the process-related data. I think that that's important. Thanks, Chris, for that. Uh, yeah. And that's why we're here, is really to start our thinking around data. And <clears throat> so why data? You know, and I think a lot of the, the topic came to me, and, and certainly Candace, when we were sitting in, the PSO uh, reviews that everybody went through in October. And what was interesting about that is it, it really was almost an exercise in do you have the data? And part of that is do you have evidence-based decision-making? So are you able to back up some of your decisions that you have with the data? Um, so that was a, uh, probably a good example of you know, where you're being asked for data from a system standpoint. Um, you know, and then there's the whole idea of comparing, ranking, informing, maybe influencing. So some of you were at the, say, at the um, Advancing Sports Summit on Monday, and you know, what I heard at that summit, big takeaway, is data-informed decisions. If we want to do something about gender equity, we've got to actually figure out what that the data says about gender equity 
in the sports sector. And the last one for me is uh, something that I've been kind of keen on with our staff. But you know, a lot of times when we think about uh, skill acquisition, we really think about the coach in that practice environment. What is the coach doing to make interventions that help the athletes to learn? Uh, but I would extend it actually a little bit further and say, well, you know, depending on how we are able to present data to our athlete, every piece of information we give to the athlete is a form of augmented feedback. And, you know, I'll challenge ourselves for, as a coaching standpoint, it really then becomes, well, how do you deliver that information to make informed decisions on part of the athlete but they're also guiding the athletes towards, you know, better self-regulated uh, learning and ultimately performance. So I do think that there's a side of that, and and I always get a kick because if I talk to our performance service staff, sometimes I say, well, you know, that that physiological data that you have, that is kind of like augmented feedback. Depending on how it's used in the training environment, it, it could be useful to the athlete's learning but then we, we don't necessarily see it as being augmented feedback. I went a little long on that because I've got no other picture slides on it later on. So, uh, But just sort of thinking the why data, and then this came up the other day, and you've heard of this uh, quote, what's measured matters. So I wanted to put in, this is obviously a bit of a plug for RBC Training Ground, but does it relate to data? Well, yeah, it does relate to data because we're involved in this testing nationally, but also provincially. So when we talk about getting testing data, there, there are opportunities where, through the system, you can actually have your athletes attend these things and get testing data. Um, you know, and I think a couple of years ago we were working with a few sports where they wanted to try and implement some testing towards their club level and were suggesting that a good opportunity could be to actually attend some of the training ground. And the other part of this is, is really kind of informing, well, what do these, what does the testing data say? So one of our um, staff, Adam Kleberger, a former national team rugby player, he's doing his master's at uh, University of Victoria, and he's actually doing an analysis around some of the inferential statistics that they're collecting on this data. And I'm, that, that was my first big word that you'll hear probably more about later on when, when Wayne gets up and tells us. So that's an example of some data that, that we're helping to collect. Um, this one is something else that I, I get questions on all the time. So as many of you know, I, I, I play a role in stewarding the, the high performance uh, system within British Columbia. And of course, we've gone around with our enhanced excellence uh, applications where we had sports apply. And of course, in applying for that, we always ask for a budget. And in the background, we take recommendations to the government. And for years, they've always asked me, well, what's the economic benefit? What's the economic impact? And of course, I'm sitting there going, I'm not an economist. I'm kind of like a sport guy that works across a lot of sports and works with coaches, which is really the part of the job I love, but I'm not an economist. But because we're taking in that information, I thought, well, it might be good to, to try and start taking a bit of a deeper dive and identifying, okay, well, where are sports getting the revenue sources and then how are they expending it? Uh, and the good news there is that you can see that we do expend a lot, 34%, and this is on average of everybody's sort of budgets that they put in, 34% going to coaching and technical leadership. Uh, there's a good proportion that goes to athlete fees, so we do see a lot 
of sports PSO still providing um, BCAAP athlete assistance. Uh, so direct funding back to athletes. Uh, and then breaking it out into sort of enhanced competition and regular competition. Because one of the things that I talk to the sports about is, you know, as a PSO, really part of our role is to put teams, athletes together that can go and compete at nationals. Because that's part of the system, right? But then what are we doing to enhance that? So if you thought about your funding and said, well, core funding really goes to that job as, as the PSO, but our enhanced funding can go to these sort of enhanced training and competition support. And then the other thing is that you'll see down there is it, it's probably quite appropriate. The sports science, sport medicine, is really a smaller slice of the overall budget. Because it may be that you're bringing in a practitioner for a camp or something like that. So I wanted to share some of that information with you just to sort of let you know that, you know, behind the scenes, we're trying to paint the picture or tell a story behind, behind some of the information that we're collecting. And I do think that it is part of the job. And this is certainly some of the pushback I get from coaches. Because what do coaches want to do? They want to be in the daily training environment affecting changes with athletes. I mean, that's brilliant. I love doing that. But there's also the other side of any job that maybe we don't like doing as much, but helps to inform progress or measurement. So teachers provide report cards. My kid's going through right now. The measurements are exceeding met or not met. Pretty much every parent I talk to, they're just meeting expectation of their kids. So I'm, I actually wonder what an exceeding expectation would look like. Probably not doing a very good job parenting. Uh, my kids are just average. Um, but, uh, sorry, I'm glad you got a bit of a kick out of that. The, you know, medicine. Uh, and what's interesting about medicine is kind of the sicker you get, the more data is collected on patients. Um, in my realm, I thought, well, because my doctors don't seem to stay around for a long time, I started tracking my own medical history so I have a sheet that I can actually have data on hand that I can hand it to the next doctor and they figure out what's wrong with me. Um, so the, the last one there, the, the guy that's smiling with the money and the, and the that, that's the salesperson. And from my perspective, that's what my wife does. She's a sales manager and uh, she's been in it for over 20 years. And the amount of data that they are required to input into devices and everything else has gone up substantially. Everybody wants to be informed by data. So from a sport perspective, you know, maybe that is becoming part of the job. And oftentimes I say to coaches, well, a lot of us practice in the present. We go there, we know what we want to accomplish with our athletes, so we very much focused on the present, and I would say we do a pretty good job of planning into the future. And our curriculum is actually set up, set up on that, practice planning and designing sport programs so that we can see in the future so that it helps inform what we're doing in the present. But the blind spot, perhaps, is how can those plans or interventions that we do in the present be informed by the past. And those are the last words I'm going to have on slides because the rest are pictures. But if you look at just a, a simple two-dimensional matrix here of time scale on the bottom and sort of key performance indicators, so some, some of those things, and we have the coaches going out to practice, if you're just doing it on a practice-by-practice practice basis. You're just showing up in a moment of time, and you've got a probably intuitive sense of where those key, key performance in, indicators are. I mean, I know most of you are coaching here, so you kind of get a really good idea of, yeah, I'm pretty informed when I'm 
in the training environment. But we know that every athlete would follow a rough theoretical performance curve. So as we see athletes progress over time, likely there's vast improvements that get incrementally smaller and smaller as we reach the ceiling of performance. Of course, it doesn't always look like that. The performance curve sometimes looks like this. And the point here is, in order to understand where the athlete is now, if you track back, you can tell the story of where those key performance indicators may have plateaued. So you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, yeah, okay, I've tracked the key performance indicator, and if you're in a sport that's maybe more of an engine-based sport, they're, they're pretty dialed into this stuff. Uh, so is the performance indicator plateauing? And does that require an intervention? So, of course, if we can see that and are informed of that, it might help us direct our interventions more in a much more targeted way that can impact that key performance indicator. And then the other question I often get is, well, that's great, Dave. So you've convinced me that maybe if we look at tracking over time, we can inform some of those progression indicators, but how much do we need to track? So I often get that question, so let's just put our theoretical uh, you know, performance curve up there. But in this case, you'll see that what I'm trying to convey here is as the athlete develops further along the pathway, the number of KPIs that you may start choosing to measure become greater. Right? And you'll hear some things from Ming later on. When we're working with national teams, how many more KPIs there are compared to, say, further down the pathway. Because one of the challenges that we have, and we all know this, is the capacity to be able to track or effectively track this data. Now, of course, technology is helping us out immensely in these areas, but if you're down way back in the athlete pathway in the grassroots, likelihood is there's a massive number of athletes there, but as you're moving through the pathway, we become more targeted, the, the athletes actually become smaller. And it's almost like the medical model, you, the sicker you get, the more indicators there are. Uh, this is the inverse of that, the better you get, there's likely fewer of you that are vying towards metals. Um, so it's probably a good idea that we are uh, informing based on some data. So I just sort of threw this out, you know, if it's my uh, U8 rugby team, I should be tracking attendance versus, and you'll hear more about this later on, but if we wanted to get into sort of load monitoring, there are a number of different KPIs that can help inform the training plan and the training stimulus that we're trying to do. So what are we going to talk about? We've got two great presenters today. The first presenter is Drew Todd, who's our Athlete Services Manager. And Drew has been tasked uh, with actually being the gatekeeper of data. So as you know, many of you are responsible for submitting targeted athlete lists to CSI Pacific. You'll either send that to me, you'll send it to Sarah, you'll send it to Candace, or you'll send it to Drew. Uh, we get the list. There's a process that we go through that sort of verifies, are the birth date right, is the right location there, uh, all those things. And I'm usually the worst culprit because... You know, I'm always the softer guy. I say, well, that list looks good enough. And then I'll send it to Drew, and then he rejects it and says, no, you're not being tough enough on these guys. We actually need their birth dates in the right way and those types of things. And I say, okay, Drew, I'll go back to them. They're going to hate me for it, but better them hating me than you. So we go back and forth on this data. But the big point on this is that we've been collecting this data for years. and. Um, you know, that's you, 
doing your inventory, and you send that to us. And rather than us holding that information, I think it's pretty good if we can actually share it. So what we've been trying to do is think about ways that we can take that athlete information, share it in a, an appropriate manner that may actually help you to make decisions around the performance pathway. And this is really about targeted athlete tracking and the whole notion of conversion. And when we did the PSO assessment, um, you know, that was one of the things that came out is, you know, even this idea of, well, how do we define conversion? So, Drew's been looking at this data for lots of years, actually, now, and he's quite informed on it, and he's going to come up and talk to you a little bit more about how you might be able to use the data that we have to inform some of your decision making. And then we can have like, yeah, like the clapping would be guys, and we only lost, uh, what, two people going into my presentation, so that's a great retention rate for me. Yeah. Now, for Mings, if I can keep hold of like 75% of you, that means that that's a win as well. Um, yeah, Dave gave me the great introduction as the gatekeeper of data. Um, that, that works. I don't know. Uh, I guess it's better than, again, just the dick that makes you guys put your birth dates in order as he also kind of eloquently said there. But um, yeah, a big part of what I do um, is just sort of managing the data from a big picture perspective. All those annual nomination lists you guys send in or um, doing the PSO enhanced excellence evaluations, all those kind of deliverables, I do a lot of kind of the crunch in the numbers and I, I kind of see things um, you know, across sports and I can probably provide a perspective that you guys within your PSOs or, or NSOs may not necessarily be able to see relative to the rest of the, the sector there. Um, so I'm just going to, eventually I'm going to get to the point and kind of show you guys some of the, the analysis that we're doing. Um, I'm also going to kind of talk about a few of the sort of best practices that I think um, can be very helpful for you and sort of the ways that I see data management and how it can be best utilized throughout the sector within sport. Um, yeah. So, so you guys saw this first slide here, but just to kind of start out uh, a little bit here, I think you guys probably all know what movie this is from, Moneyball. Um, you know, Brad Pitt uh, is a good movie. I think it was nominated for some Oscars. Based on the book Moneyball, written by Money, or written by Money Lewis, Michael Lewis, all around uh, the story of the Oakland Athletics in 2002, I think, and their run to the AL West pennant. Um, you know, I, I would say this is probably where, like, analytics, sabermetrics, all those things really came to the forefront in the mainstream. Um, data analysis had always been used for a long, long time before that, but I'd say the general public, the average sports fan, wasn't really aware that these um, analytics existed until this movie came out. So while I totally agree with the underlying philosophy that data and statistics are very important to sport, I also kind of hate this movie, and I hate the book, because it is absolutely riddled with errors and omissions um, from actually capturing the real value and why Oakland won the pennant that year. And in a lot of ways, I think it did some sort of damage to the, you know, the analytics movement because it kind of forgot to mention all these other important factors and almost gave rise to this anti-statistics movement, which uh, I think is exemplified for this other movie that came out from Hollywood. Um, I don't know. Does anybody know what this movie is from? Yeah, there you go. So it's a Clint Eastwood movie. It's another baseball movie, but it's essentially saying that, like, you know, the stats guys in the organization are just total idiots. They only look at computers and numbers. They have no feel for the game. And the real value is the old school scouts who can you know, um, analyze uh, performance and projections just based on the eye test. I think there's like one ridiculous part of the movie where uh, one of the scouts um, listens to a guy throw a curveball against a garage. 100% knows that guy is going to be a superstar, advocates for a million dollar contract for him. It's a little ridiculous, you know. The fact of the matter is, it's somewhere in, right in the middle, right? We want to use statistics for a little bit, but we also know that you can see things in person, and there's an art to coaching to really find and target the right athletes for your program. Uh, and I like this quote here. You may have seen it in different forms. It's uh, relatively common, but uh, statistics are like bathing suits. So they show a lot, 
but not necessarily everything. By the way, if uh, you put that quote into your Google search at work, and uh, a colleague walks by and sees you looking at a bunch of pictures of bathing suits and stuff like that, and get a little awkward. So I'll just, just say it. Maybe uh, turn your computer away from your staff. <laughs> Kendra here walks by. Uh, why do you got pictures of bikinis all over your computer? What's going on here? I'm like, no, I swear to God, it's for work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But neither approach tells the complete story. You can't go too far to one side of the spectrum and base all your you know, decision making on, on what the data says. And you also just can't assume that everybody sees the game the same as you and that you can scout everybody based on, on the eye test. So if you go too far to the statistics side of things, you end up looking, you know, treating sport like this, that everybody's a robot. There's no art to coaching. Um, every human being reacts the exact same. Obviously, that would be ridiculous. On the other end, you don't want to be this guy, um, <laughs> you know, because the game's going to pass you by, and you're just going to show that you have a really inability to evolve, inability to change and adapt to the modern way of sport. Um, I'm not sure if anybody also saw the, about a month ago a bit of controversy with Don Cherry and the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, to be honest, there's a great meme of, of Don Cherry being Grandpa Simpson yelling at them. I don't think anybody probably exemplifies the anti-statistic movement more than Don Cherry, and I hope none of you are really basing your entire coaching uh, strategy on what he says on Coach's Corner. So Dave uh, touched on this a little bit too, and this is sort of my thoughts as well, why data management is important. Um, obviously, there's a, a million reasons out there, but I just kind of highlighted four here. Um, first off, uh, you know, the most important thing is it really informs proper decision making when it comes to programming, selection, targeting, whatever the case may be. And I kind of like to think that every decision you make is in itself just like a small puzzle. You know, if you want to make the best decision, you want to collect as much information as possible. You want to get all those puzzle pieces in place because then you know you're going in the right direction. Um, it helps project future value and performance. This is the big thing with professional sports and, and uh, analytics there. If you've got $10 million to spend on free agency, you have a choice of two different players, um, you know, maybe the statistics can help inform the decision on who's going to project to be the better player two, three, four years from now. And then the last one there is that you know, data can really help reduce systematic and, and personal biases. Know, um, whether they're inherent, conscious, or unconscious, we all have biases that exist, and it, not necessarily for our own fault, but you know, having that extra information can, can really help, I'd say, mitigate those mistakes. You know, for a lot of reasons, I'd say we're all probably based out of the Lower Mainland or Vancouver Island. You know, it's the biggest hub, um, maybe it makes more you know, economical sense, whatever the case may be, but simply by doing that, we now have a bias against athletes in Kelowna, Kamloops, Prince George, across the province. And it's not because we don't respect or value any of those athletes there, but simply just having the money to go out there and, and scout athletes across the province is unrealistic. So maybe by implementing a good data management system and analysis, we have the opportunity to um, bring those outlying regions into the fold a bit more and make better use of our own resources. Uh, and I kind of wanted to, to key on this data-informed decision-making part that Dave mentioned as, as evidence-based decision-making. You know, obviously it has a bunch of different words all kind of mean the exact same thing, though. Um, I do find sometimes in sport, we almost put ourselves on an island, and, and we think we're unique and special and different. And granted, that's true. You know, we have a different clientele. We have a different product, and we do do things a little bit differently than other sectors but not so much that we can't learn best practices and adapt um, operational components from other industries and utilize them for ourselves. So Dave talked about in the health industry and in education. I just did a quick online search, and in about two minutes, I found four research-backed articles advocating for the use of data-informed decision-making in four different sectors, education, insurance, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals. Give me another half hour, I'm sure I could find a research paper on every single industry out there, saying that data is essential. Uh, and I also came across these two definitions of what data and information are that I really like, because I really think they kind of hammered down what we're talking about here. So 
um, data is the distinct facts, numbers, words, and images from raw input of organizational life. We're all organizations here. We're all companies. We can still kind of think in those terms. And then once they're processed in some sort of meaningful way, it becomes information that is interpreted and understood for a particular purpose. Start with our data, crunch the numbers, analyze it, make it information, and then make decisions based on that information. And just to kind of illustrate that process to get from data to information, um, I've kind of highlighted four steps. Uh, you know, I've called it data management. When you get to Ming's, he calls this whole process more data solutions. He has, I think, about seven or eight steps here. That's the difference between a PhD and an undergrad. So I'll give you the, the, the layman's version, and he'll get very scientific on you and it'll be much smarter sounding. But we think we've pretty much captured the same stuff. Uh, so the first step, this is the obvious one. It's, it's the raw data collection. You know, if you're in a, a fitness testing session, doing a vertical jump test, how high does the athlete jump? 30 centimeters, write it down. That's collecting data. In sort of my perspective, um, from the programming side of things and the system side of things, you know, it's the annual nomination lists that you guys send to us from the Institute. So you guys are collecting the data from the athletes in terms of you know, birthday, gender, discipline, whatever. I'm collecting the data from you guys when you send it to me. The second step of the process is what we call cleaning the data. And I think this is the probably the most um, undervalued and overlooked step, but can have really critical ramifications in the whole decision-making process. And I would say we need to sort of, as a collective, um, focus on this a bit more. So when we say cleaning the data, this is sort of like standardizing the data. If we look at that vertical jump testing example, um, one coach does a, a vertical jump test, they submit the data in centimeters. Another coach does the same test, they submit it in inches. Well, in order to prepare that data for analysis, you're going to have to get them both to be inches or both to be centimeters, right? And um, in, in terms of what we do when we look at these athlete nomination lists, you know, oftentimes we'll have mistakes. As Dave was kind of saying, weird formats that they come in, um, maybe gaps. Uh, Things like that. I think I've got, yeah, I got an example. Uh, I'm glad this particular sport isn't here today, but I'm not going to say who it was. But this is a list I got a couple months ago. We have a column for last name and a column for first name. And you can see that they've mixed up first name and last name in three out of the first, what's that, 11 names or something. So hopefully from CSI Pacific, when we get these lists and we see these mistakes, we can make the adjustments and we can clean that data for you. But I'm going to be honest, like, I'm a redneck from northern BC. I'm familiar with names like John and Steve and Michael. Uh, some sports have these crazy names that I've never seen in my entire life. Maybe not crazy, but, you know, I've never seen before. I don't know if it's a first name or a last name. So, you know, when we look at sort of the, the historical comparison and trends, uh, we may be double counting athletes and not having the exact data just because it wasn't cleaned properly before being sent to us. Um, something we see a lot too, actually, is you know one year you'll nominate somebody named um, like Kate Jackson, the next year you nominate Catherine Jackson, next year you nominate Katie Jackson, and it's usually okay, uh, especially if it's just me kind of looking at the data every year. But if I leave CSI Pacific, if Dave fires me after this terrible presentation, you know, we're <laughs> somebody else is going to come in and they're not going to have that kind of historical comparison. So they're not going to know, and you're going to end up counting the same athlete three or four times in the system, just on um, a really simple mistake. Uh, then the third step is, is analyzing the data, crunching the numbers. This is probably the most complex step, obviously, and uh, depending on what you're trying to pull out of the, the data that comes in, you know, you may need a, a bit of a mathematical or statistical background. Um, but as we're kind of kind of move forward today, we're going to show you that CSI Pacific is actually doing a lot of this data analysis for you guys, and um, you'll have the opportunity to kind of see it from your sports uh, perspective. So, yeah, that's taking the data, putting it into a fancy chart, and then sort of making the decisions based on it. Yeah, fourth step, using the data. But as you can tell, it's, it's a sequential process, right? 
you have to go through step one to step two to eventually get to step four. And if there's a breakdown in the data management or data solutions process, um, you're going to end up making potentially the wrong decision. And you're going to lead to programming mistakes, and you're going to go down a road that really would have been easily fixed if you had just collected the data properly. Yeah, Toby. I would say analyzing the data. Um, you know, listen, I, I taught myself how to do a lot of um, stuff just through Google and ex on Excel and stuff like that, and eventually figuring out the formulas and getting to it. So, you know, if you're really good at doing that stuff, it's pretty quick, but I would say if you don't have that background, it's going to take a while. Um, actually collecting the data, you know, it depends on what you're trying to measure. Like, for a lot of you guys at the PSO angle, this can mean getting data from clubs all over the province, right? And then part of that process is teaching the club coaches how to collect that data properly. So that, I would say, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, may take the longest. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, to the, the first two steps. Because um, I think it's, it's unreasonable to expect us all at the PSO level, especially in smaller PSOs, to have somebody on staff who really has a strong mathematical or statistics background to be able to do really great data analyzing. But collecting data and cleaning the data, this is a relatively easy process. It just requires us to prioritize it and, and focus on it and pay attention to it. There's no special skill any of us have to be able to slot last name into the right column and first name into the right column, right? So um, we can all kind of improve on this, and obviously myself and CSI Pacific included, um, but once we really sort of lock in on those first two steps, I think it'll really sort of support the analysis that we can do and the decision making to go forward on it. So let's look at sort of um, getting to that eventually get into those athlete targeting lists, those nomination lists. We know it starts with your athlete targeting criteria, which then informs the nomination lists that come in. And just kind of some questions I want you to sort of think about as I go through, but um, outside of competition, you know, are you doing anything to identify your high potential athletes? Is your pathway simply provincial championships, junior national championships, world championships, and that's all you use to, to target your athletes? Or do you include what we call performance-based criteria that um, can be things around the gold medal profile or annual fitness testing or benchmarks, things like that? Um, you know, we're trying to work closely with the PSOs to make sure that we capture a little bit of event-based targeting and a little bit of performance-based targeting to make sure that you're getting the right athletes in the pathway and in the system. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a sec here. Uh, but just another question to kind of ask, you know, and I alluded to this earlier, without the resources, especially like we're all, we're all budget and capacity strapped in the sport industry here, in the sports sector in BC, um, are there ways that we can identify those, those athletes in outlying regions, those diamonds in the rough, um, through a, a very robust data management system so that we don't have to spend our time traveling around the province and working closely with the coaches and the athletes. So maybe it's not applicable for every sport, but it's definitely something to consider. And I just got this little bullet there about national program versus provincial program. Because um, a lot of the work we do when we sort of evaluate across the system and, and PSO performance is that we hear from a lot of sports that you know it's, it's impossible to convert athletes to national program. There's an East Coast bias. Um, it's too much money to send our athletes to different competitions where the national scouts are, et cetera, et cetera. And absolutely, those are valid concerns. And that's a real challenge we have being based out on the West Coast for a lot of sports. But I just want to make sure that you're also considering, um, if you're having those challenges with the national system, are you also then passing those on to your provincial system? Do you think that maybe the athletes in Kamloops are bitching about you guys in Vancouver saying, oh, they never come out and look for us, or they never notice us, the same way that you're saying, oh, in Ottawa, they're never paying attention to us, that kind of thing. So, you know what, I, I don't think anybody's intentionally doing that in the system, but oftentimes I think that without even really realizing it, 
we're really playing into that lower mainland bias, and I think there's a lot that you know a good data management system can do to help mitigate that. So, you know, one analogy for this event-based versus performance-based criteria can be don't put all your eggs in one basket. Another analogy that I like is sort of related to finance. When you're building your investment portfolio, you know, who here is putting 100% of their money into a high-risk stock? You know, that's insane. Yeah, Dave? <laughs> yeah, so you would have retired years ago, but uh, playing a little catch-up. Yeah. And you know what, that's a great plan if you're investing in Microsoft in the 80s. You'd be a billionaire. Um, however, hopefully your investment advisor is not uh, recommending you go with that strategy. You know, hopefully it's a nice mix, or sorry, mix of, of a little um, high-risk stock or maybe some you know, low-interest bonds or high-dividend yield uh, stocks, things like that. You can see here, like, this is a healthy, diversified portfolio. We want your criteria to be diversified so that you're, you're capturing your best athletes and the ones with the most potential, but you're not missing out on some um, that, that maybe just haven't produced yet at a, at a competition. And when we talk about event-based criteria, I mean, I'm sure you guys can kind of take a guess of what we're talking about. Things like, you know, meddling at nationals, competing at worlds, selecting for Team Canada to, you know, participate in the international competition. Performance-based criteria, things like this. So, you know, very, very much more sport specific, but you know, achieving say 90% of a senior and international standard, um, hitting the minimum standard in 75% of your GMP benchmarks, things like that. So just, just things to consider. I've been, I was working with the PSO uh, just recently. who's not here today, unfortunately, but um, their whole pathway was just based around attending one event in the year. And I asked the question, you know, like, what if that athlete just for reasons outside of their actual skill and ability, has a bad performance. Are you just completely taking them off the pathway? And, and he says, no. And I'm like, okay, like, so why aren't you? Can we, can we define on paper those other things that you're looking for when you target athletes? Um, so this is, the criteria then sets up your, your nomination list, or you showed a picture earlier, but you guys should have probably all seen one of these before. And it captures quite a bit of information. So we get the athlete level, the PD2, PD1, CanDev, etc. Gets the athlete's gender. Gets the athlete's date of birth. Sport discipline, if applicable. Uh, the primary and secondary coach, again, if applicable. And the region and the city that they're located in BC. So that much information from all the different athletes that you nominate over 10 years of time, there's a ton of data that we can use to really look at gaps and trends and opportunities for your sport and for the system in general. I don't even think we've scratched the surface of what we can do. And me and Dave have really been working on this for at least three, four years um, pre-focused. So uh, I highlighted these ones. Um, that's pretty much what, we're, what we've been doing and what we're going to look at today. The athlete's level, their gender, and the date of birth. But hopefully in the future I want to move towards evaluating those other um, bullets there. You know, do we see a trend between certain coaches and their ability to convert athletes? Or is there a real pocket in your sport around the province? Like, are there tons of athletes from the Okanagan who are converting? Things like that. What are they doing? What can we learn from those clubs and apply it to all the rest of our clubs around the province? And just because we're not doing this um, for you at this moment, it doesn't mean that you guys can't also, just within your sport, look back at your lists that you've submitted and do a lot of statistical analysis yourselves. So the four kind of main measures that I'm going to talk about are based around the, the conversion rate data. We're going to look at it, um, what we can tell you about uh, your own sport and sport-specific stuff, and then look at it, what it can tell us about the entire provincial sports system. Um, and then we did some analysis on athletes' date of birth, uh, targeting them, and sort of combined it with our existing conversion data to see if we can see some trends about um, the ages that you're targeting and if it's working out well for the conversion of the pipeline. Uh, so just a quick um, background on, on sort of that athlete conversion statistic. It's based on athlete lists that we've been getting since about 2008 for a lot of sports. 
Um, not everybody has 10 years of data, but we probably have at least five years of data from about 45 different sports, 50 different sports, which is great. And the more data we get over the years, the, the better we're going to be able to do here. Um, back in the day, 2008, 2009, I'm not sure if anybody was around back then, but there was a whole bunch of weird terminology on what the athlete levels were. Like, I think there was like 10, 12 different things we called it. But uh, a couple of years ago, we tried to really simplify the process and just narrowed it down to four standard levels across. So provincial development level two, provincial development level one, Canadian development, and then Sport Canada card in it. And just lumped, doesn't matter what level Sport Canada card, just lump them all in the same. Um, you don't have to, to be a successful conversion. It doesn't have to be step by step up the pathway. If you've got an athlete that comes in at the PD2 level, makes a huge jump to the national team, we still count that as a conversion. However, they have to be within a three-year window. So if you're targeting an athlete and it takes them eight years to convert up the pipeline, well, that's not necessarily going to be a successful conversion because that's probably not the best use of your resources and you probably target them a bit too early. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we can't necessarily say that one way works for all sports, but I think through some of the research that I know Dave did when we sort of implemented this thing, um, it was discovered that the three-year window was pretty reasonable across all sports. I think it really comes down to sort of when you target your app. Through the levels. Yeah, each level, sort of, you have a three. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I think, yeah, you're right. Some sports, early specialization sports, maybe it's a tighter window. Late specialization sports, maybe it does take a little bit longer. But I think from the PSO perspective, um, you know, everybody, if they're not in the national program, maybe by the age of their 20, that's probably a safe bet. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I definitely should have clarified that. Yeah, yeah, it's not just, uh, yeah. If, if you're not on the Olympic podium by the time we first targeted you, then get the, just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at things from uh, an individual sport perspective. So here's kind of, um, you know, one question I want us to think about throughout all these statistical measures. What is the story that the data can tell you about your program or about the system? Just simply looking at the chart or the graphs, the output, isn't going to give you all the answers you need. You need to think critically about why the data is telling you this. Is there a good reason for it? And that's fine. But if it catches you off guard, you know, that could be a red flag and that might need a, a deeper look and let's make some interventions there. So some of the things, um, it can tell us a lot of stuff, but some of the quick things that the conversion rates can tell us, it's not just conversion, but you know, you can do a trend analysis looking at the number of athletes that you've nominated over the years. Obviously, it's a very simple thing, but, you know, if you're looking from 2008 to 2018, and it's a completely different number every year that you're targeting, that might be worth a deeper look. You know, why, why can't we be consistent? Why do we keep having these peak years and going through these cycles? Is there a way to sort of standard um, across there? You're going to conversion rate year to year. That's an easy thing. Uh, we can also look at the differences between male and female conversion. This sort of goes back to that inherent biases uh, thing I was talking about earlier. You know, is there a real gender equity in your programming? Um, the data might be able to tell you something that you just haven't been able to see for yourself. Maybe you are giving too many resources to one gender program than the other one. Um, here's something I really like. You know, looking at conversion before or after a program intervention. This is something that only you guys would be able to tell um, based on asking why when you look at the data. So say you hired a, a provincial coach in 2008, 2012, and 2016. Well, if we look at sort of your conversion rates each year, maybe there's a big spike from 2013 to 2015, and then it goes down afterwards. Well, you might look and say, uh, our coach, the 2012 coach, what were they doing? Because clearly there's a lot of success right after. Is there things that we can adapt from their program and apply it to the current head coach's program? 
Um, and then, obviously, with, with any sort of statistical analysis, it can help you with projections, help you identify future trends, and really plan for the, um, for the next years. Uh, so just show a couple quick charts that I can grab. Um, that one I was just talking about, so this is a sport, looking at the number of the athletes they've targeted. So this blue line kind of represents the, the PD2 athletes, which are the ones that you guys as the PSOs have the most touch on and most influence on. And it's kind of all over the place, right? 2008, they targeted 10 athletes. A few years later, they're targeting 70. The year after that, they're targeting 15. There might be a really reasonable explanation for this. Maybe they just had way too broad a criteria for these couple years there, and they really tightened it up. Totally justifiable. However, you might, or this sport might be thinking like, oh yeah, we're pretty much the same year to year. And the data is telling us this. It's like, oh, okay, that's not what I expected. Let's look into this. Why? What's going on here? Um, and then here's an example of looking at male and female conversion rates. You know, so uh, it was relatively the same over the first couple of years. Then it looks like for a few years there's a bit of a gap where they're converting many more men than women. Um, then it's kind of gone back and forth. You know, 2017, like all the guys are converting, none of the girls are converting. Granted, that was only a couple years ago. Maybe they haven't had enough time, but it could be worth investigating further. And keep in mind that each one of your sports, we have charts like this built specifically um, for each of you. And I'll talk about it at the end, but you can access those from us anytime you want. So now let's kind of look at things from a, a system perspective and some of the data that we're collecting uh, at the Institute level. Again, ask yourselves the question, What's the story this data can tell us, and, and why is it telling us this? So it can give us information on general baselines and targets for conversion. You know, you guys probably only understand what's going on in your sport, but until you have another sport to, to compare that against, you're not really sure if you're doing a good job or a poor job. This can give us um, a bit more of that answer. We can do categorical comparisons among sports. So we can look at, is there, is there trends between what individual sports are doing versus team sports? Again, male versus female. Um, I think we can do some really interesting stuff on able-bodied sport versus para sport. I mean, granted, there's going to be a very big difference in um, you know the, the number of data points with AB uh, versus para, but um, there could be some really interesting questions to see two very unique categories of sport, and is one significantly better than the other, and what can we learn from each other? Uh, something that is very applicable to what I do and what um, our team does at CSI Pacific, you know, we can get a general idea of the impact of CSI or Pacific Sport Athlete Registration. So I can look and see, are the sports that do a better job registering their athletes with us, do they actually see that in their conversion? Are, are those sports having a, doing a better job of getting athletes to the pipeline? And, oh, yeah. So... That was it for my bullets. I thought I had another one. Apparently not. Um, here's just an example of looking at the entire provin provincial roll-up of um, PD level 2 conversions each year. So other than maybe a couple outliers in 2011 and 2012, we can see that you know it's about 26-27% is what, um, what the average is. So if you're converting athletes around that level, you're probably doing okay. Uh, so this next chart here is kind of that one I was just talking about, the impact of CSI Pacific registration. So along the x-axis here, we look at the sports registration rate of every athlete they've ever nominated in the last 10 years. On the y-axis, you can see what their average conversion rate was over that 10-year span at the PD2 level. And then we can plot each sport on there. So it's not necessarily a very strong correlation, but it is a positive correlation. So that's a good thing for me. Um, we can't necessarily say how long each athlete was registered with us right now, exactly what benefits and programs they accessed, but we can at least say that they, we had a touch point on that athlete and they were introduced into the high performance system and accessed some sort of multi-sport service. Um, you know, and, and I think anecdotally, you know, we advocate for the fact that 
we're offering a suite of free benefits and services for your athletes, up to three to four thousand dollars of VIK. So we like to say, think that you know, it makes sense. The more your athletes are accessing, the more free stuff they're getting, the more opportunity they have to convert through the pipeline. We know that it's not going to be probably the make or break for 99% of your athletes, but possibly for a couple of your athletes, getting that support, getting that service is making the difference for them going up through the pipeline. Um, again, so not super strong correlation, but I would say that if it was a negative correlation, that's when I had to go back and look at myself in the mirror and go back to our team and say, what we're doing, it's not helping. Um, so anytime uh, you guys are like, why the hell do I got to put together a program and get my athletes to come in, I'm going to have this slide locked and loaded and show you that it does help. At least the data is sort of supporting what we're trying to advocate for. So now let's look kind of um, at some of the, the date of birth athlete age analysis that we're doing. And I would say before I, I kind of talk about some of the statistical measures, just keep in mind when we're talking about athlete ages, it, this is probably best utilized in a sport specific context. So this kind of goes to what you're talking about, Kevin. Um, you know, with athlete conversion, we standardize the levels across all sports, but when we took an athlete's date of birth, it's almost impossible to standardize because every sport has a different window when they best want to target athletes through their high performance pathway. And um, it's just specific age metric versus relative age metric. You know, depending on the time of year that you guys submit us your lists, you know, your athletes can be on average 16.2 years old or 16.7 years old on a statistic measure. So don't get too hung up on what that exactly says when we look at this data. Look at it more within your sport. Um, are they on average 16 years old one year? Are they 19 years old next year? Things like that. So some of the questions that um, this analysis can help us answer, you know, what is the age range that athletes are targeted in your sport? Again, similar to the number of athletes we target, is the age consistent? Is it variable? And, and always asking that critical question, why? Why is the data telling us this? Um, I know this is sort of one thing that, that Dave is, is definitely trying to impress a lot of, upon a lot of sports. Through this analysis, do we identify some gaps in service delivery and targeting for, for levels of athletes? Um, you know, and I'm not trying to assign the PSOs more work if you know, the 18 and 19 year olds aren't getting any benefits or any action or any service. But what we can say is that maybe just identify those athletes, target them on your lists, and find a way for them at least to access support from CSI Pacific or Pacific Sport. Keep them in the system long enough that they're getting something, whether or not it's actually direct high performance programming or not. Yeah, that's awesome, and like, you know, and it's not a ton of work, so you don't have to hire a head coach or anything to specifically program for those athletes. But if the NSO is not necessarily stepping in and helping those athletes out, you know, at the PSO level, can we do that? And, and this also happens a lot with, you know, especially NCAA or, or U Sport athletes, that we hope that they're getting serviced um, post post high school and before they get onto that national team. But maybe there's some athletes at that age level that just aren't going through the U-Sport system or the NCAA system that could still have potential to, to convert one day. You know? And maybe seeing if we can find a way to service them. Or even if they are going to NCAA, like, they still spend four months of the year in BC. So maybe let's keep an eye on them, help them out over that summer months before they have to go back to school in the States. Uh, and then some other questions when we sort of adapt it to the conversion rates that we can answer. Um, so does the age of the athletes that are actually converting, so say that top 25% of your athletes you're targeting, does that actually align with the other 75% of athletes you're targeting? So, so are you building the right conversion windows for your athletes? And you'll be able to tell that by looking at the age of the athletes who are actually converting up the pathway. Again, 
targeting too young, too old. And then another good question here is, are you allowing athletes enough time in the system to realistically convert? So to kind of show you some of the analysis that we're doing when it comes to the athlete age stuff, is I'm going to give you a couple examples of, of two sports and how their PD2 kind of pathway and targeting has worked over the years. So uh, starting out, so we've got this chart here. Again, each year that we've been submitted an athlete targeted list from 2008 to 2017 in this case. And on the y-axis, we show the average age of all the athletes that were targeted at that level. So, I mean, here you can see that, you know, there's been a bit of a, a steady decline, but that's not necessarily um, a good or a bad thing. It's just sort of how the program is adapted. So what I'm going to do with this age, so this is when they're very first targeted in the pathway. So I'm going to put a, add three years on to each of these data points, because that's sort of the three-year window we're talking about here. I kind of come up with what I call this conversion window. And if an athlete, by the time they finish their third year and they've gotten to here, from when they first entered the pathway, we expect them to hopefully have converted by then or probably um, have fallen off the list. So the next line here, this is the average age and the athlete is when they are last targeted in the system. So it should be relatively close to this line, but just a little bit under. And what I also like is that these are relatively parallel to each other. So there's definitely some synchronicity within sort of beginning of the pathway and the end of the pathway. Uh, and right now, I mean, I, I think that all looks realistic and, and pretty good. But the litmus test, again, is seeing what's the average age of the athletes who are actually converting in the pathway. Because ideally, it should be somewhere in the middle here, right? That's what this red dot is signifying for this sport. So they actually didn't convert anybody until 2010. But the, the age of the converting athletes has been pretty much within the middle here. So... You know, there's no right or wrong answer to any of this, but I don't necessarily see any huge red flags when I look at this. Of course, if, if you're this particular sport, and this is not what you expected at all, that might actually be a red flag. So let's look at a different sport with the same sort of chart and see if we, what we can infer from that. So this sport, um, when athletes are very first targeted at the PD2 level and they come in the system, you know, they're about 17 years old. So build our ideal conversion window. And the yellow line is telling us that's the average age the last time they were targeted. So that's a pretty small window when you kind of look at the three-year window like that. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it kind of appears that the second time, the second year an athlete gets targeted, it's like make or break it time then. Is that, is that enough time for them to convert? But let's look at the average age when they do convert. And you get this line. So this is almost completely in line with the last time they're targeted. So you target an athlete for one year, target that same athlete for a second year, and that second year, it's shit or get off the pot time. Is that an effective program, an effective targeting window? Maybe, but I might suggest that this is an average, so there's probably a lot of athletes that are converting much higher. So to capture everybody and make sure that you don't accidentally miss out on an athlete, it might be worth extending that targeting window by one year um, so that you're not losing these athletes. Again, every sport is different. Every sport has a graph like that, and this data can help fill in the pieces of the puzzle so that you can program and you can target in the most effective way. Uh, yeah, so this is what one sport looked like. Whoops. This is what the other sport looked like. So you can see there's some differences there for sure. Um, yeah, so just to kind of wrap things up and highlight some of the key points I'm trying to get across there is that, you know, days of the eye test are certainly over, I hope. I hope we're not scouting and targeting based on the sound of a fastball or a curveball hitting the wall. But it's important not just to go completely um, to the data and statistics side of things. 
Um, good data collection and data cleaning process are absolutely essential to inform decision making. And the nomination list and the criteria that uh, we guys have you do once a year, as Dave outlined, this can be a bit of an onerous task sometimes, but it is important to more than just seeing which athletes can get a free gym pass. There's so much more that goes into it, and there's so much more value that data can add to the entire system as a whole. And also, as we report back to you guys on what that data is telling us. Uh, and as always, the critical question is why. Why are the numbers saying this? What do we need to look at more? So, so like I said, like we have this a spreadsheet like this for every single sport. If you guys want access to that, you should already probably have my email address, but there it is again, or just give me a phone call. I'm totally happy to send that to you guys. And we can even set up a meeting where I can walk you through exactly what everything means on there, give you, provide you some context. Uh, Kevin Black's here. I mean, we had a call a couple months ago, and we just set up a, an online meeting and spent 20 minutes, and I just kind of showed him everything about the data. So we can absolutely do this for you, and it's a service we can provide. Right, Chris? Yeah, I would say just uh, send me an email to request it. Um, that's probably best. Yeah, and then, but it's a really simple thing for me to kind of cut and paste and send to you. Uh, oh, yeah. So I'm done. Is that you? Yeah. Cool. Right, thanks, oh, guys. That's great. Thanks. You want this uh, bad boy? This, you know, it's a ton of work what we're trying to do and collecting this. But once again, it's just, if you look at it from the standpoint that it's just identifying athletes so they get benefits. But if we really do a good job trying to maybe analyze the data, we're giving something back to the system. I know nationally we're the only province that has this data. You know, so um, it's pretty good. Now one of the things I'll do is let, let's take a break for about eight minutes. Um, and we'll come back but in your break, I mean, circulate around the room, but based on Drew's presentation, I'm really interested in what questions uh, you want to answer. So based on having that presentation on what we have, what do you want? Because that'll help guide us into maybe doing some more analysis. Okay, so let's take a break. Grab some cookies at the back in order to collect those questions. And we should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, at least ten good questions out of this. Maybe more if some of our staff complete the questions. But Candace has got some sticky notes here. She's going to hand them out. You're going to write your question on it as far as what you want to know based on Drew's presentation. What type of data would be beneficial to you? And I'll just give you a little anecdotal story. I know some of you showed up to the Advancing Sports Summit the other day, and as in all of these kind of presentations that you get, the culmination was, okay, we've given you a lot of information, now what are you going to do about it? Right? Which gives you ownership. Sometimes I think maybe uh, it's better if, you, if the system can do something about some of the challenges. But it was interesting... For you that weren't there, uh, the morning session was on, on gender equity. And the culmination was really looking at, well, what can you do as an organization to ensure better gender equity? And, and the reality is, is really um, having female athletes in parity with male athletes. So... I thought about it for a bit, and this is more the anecdote, immediately came to my mind. I said, well, what is our gender equity in targeting athletes? So, so do we actually target our athletes equally? I sent an email to Drew. We got all confused in our communication, and <laughs> we weren't able to get the actual... Um, percentage. So that, that to me is curious. I, I'm, I'm curious to know over a 10-year period of targeting, do we actually target on gender equity? Then I thought, well, you know, 
it'd be cool because then we could just mandate that every list should have gender equity on it. So if Ke Kevin provides his list, then he's got to have equal male and females on the list. So I thought about that for about 30 seconds, and then I figured out about 100 ways why that wouldn't work. And of course, one of the ways was that I was starting to think of the sports that were in the room, like ringette, artistic swimming, softball, which are predominantly targeting female athletes. And then I thought, well, what if, because some of, uh, some of the sports have very good performance criteria, uh, in their targeting, so based off uh, some of the podium pathway information that they're using from national teams. What if uh, a sport has 10 females that meet the target? And then they only have five males. And because it's a performance-oriented uh, system, it would probably be unfair for us to say in that circumstance, well, we would only accept five females when actually there were 10 that made the standard. So, of course, I just threw the, the whole thing away because I, I think it wouldn't work. But, it, but the better question was, you know, do we have the information that can tell us some of those questions around, say, gender equity? And the other thing, too, that I think in all of this is understanding whether the information that we have is true. And that, that's where we're going to be going with Ming's presentation, because what you saw Drew present on was what we would call a lot of descriptive statistics. So describing what we see by the numbers. But then there's a big question around, do you, can you believe the numbers? And that's where scientists come in, because scientists, and this, this is your introduction, Ming. Hope you like this one. Um, let's go in the right direction. <laughs> We're going to get into data solutions, OK? So this is the realm that many of our performance service staff work in. And you can imagine that when a sport comes to CSI Pacific at uh, a national team level, uh, like we're working with wheelchair rugby, they probably do look like this. They've got all sorts of measures <laughs> coming out of them. Uh, you know, and your, your head coach is an a, a analytics guy, so he probably loves the numbers. Um, but my point is, is yes, we want to collect some of this information but really, it's how we choose to disseminate it. And that's where I think through Ming's work, you can sort of go from all that noise into, well, something very simple. That was my try at trying to take complex to simple. Um, so it's great to have, have Ming here. Uh, Drew is saying uh, you've got these these names that are unpronounceable, so we just call Ming Ming, because uh, none of us can actually pronounce his name. So sorry, Ming. Uh, but Ming's come from us. I think you've been working in the institute for three years now. Yeah, and we really poached him through uh, the University of Toronto. Obviously, a background in. Uh, statistics, but uh, more importantly, from my perspective, he's also a coach. So he understands coaching. Uh, so kind of a, the, the rare combination of scientist and coach um, that we're working on that at UBC with some of our students. So bring Ming up, and Ming's going to start to talk about the data solutions that we have through CSI Pacific. And it's a bit of a deeper dive into some of the things that Drew was talking about. So thanks, Ming, for coming and presenting. Yeah, you, you have to figure that one out. Hold on. Yep. So what I'm going to do is go through this data solutions process that uh, Drew sort of you know, uh, brought up before. 
he calls it the, uh, you know, the data management. And it's roughly the same, you know, steps. It's just like, the reason I call it data solution is just trying to be consistent with what uh, the CSI Pacific's uh, pillars, right? We, we recently started this uh, new um, discipline called data solutions and we have, uh, and I, I want to be consistent with just our, uh, our, um, our pillars that we, we have set out. And, and the, uh, in general, within the data solutions, we, we, we go through these steps. It, it, you know, there's a big broad scale where raw data is where, you know, Drew calls it collecting the data part, you know, collecting the data from whatever sport that, uh, you know, we're working with. And I think um, with what Drew had on there, it was, uh, like, is it uh, cleaning data? Yeah. Cleaning data is where what I have is the, you know, part of the data processing side. Part of that will be cleaning the data. And then I think you lump all the analysis, data analysis. And I would say that oh, oh, this part, oh, this part of oh, now the flow chart is where Drew calls it data analysis. And then there's the uh, using the data, which is what we're going to report and interpret and report the data. So it's a visualization part, right? Um, so there are three areas in the uh, data solutions, uh, you know, discipline where we call the data collection and the processing part the data management. So within the uh, data processing, we're looking at, you know, a lot of the, the, the cleaning part, right? But also within there, um, there is the, the, the descriptive, like the, the initial exploratory uh, type of analysis. So for example, if you want to just quickly look at what is the, what is the average, what is the, uh, you know, the standard deviation, like just looking at what the spread of the, the data looks like. Or even that a lot of times you want to, you want to calculate or determine some like sports specific, uh, specific, uh, specific metrics to your own sport, then that's where you'll do a lot of the, a lot of the calculations, right? Uh, so, and then that's where your, your whole database essentially is going to be, you know, you're developing that database side. Next will be the, the actual analytics. So that is very different from just like your analysis with, you know, where I, th I think people are getting, you know, sometimes like confuse the two words of analysis and the analytics. For me, at least, when I speak of the word analysis, it generally means just very descriptive, trying to understand the, you know, trying to summarize the data that you collect. So, you know, so, so that would be like max or min or averages, standard deviation, all these different, uh, you know, uh, functions or you know, calculations that you can do quickly to just to, to get a nice picture of what, uh, what the data that you've collected looks like. The analytics part is where, you know, we have to, we want to validate whatever the metrics or even the equipment that you're using. Sometimes, you know, the, for example, right now, there's a lot of uh, apps that's coming out to, to measure a bunch of stuff. Like, you know, we got to make sure that these apps are accurate. We got to validate them before we can really trust and start either monitoring, you know, as a monitoring tool or, you know, you, do in do more you know, further analysis or investigation into it, right? So, and the last step is the uh, the reporting, the visualization, and that includes whatever you generated from the analytics, the results, interpreting that, and then presenting it to to the coaches or the practitioners for a better understanding. Okay. And as and uh, as I said. All these, uh, the workflow on the top, those are all descriptive, right? Just, just essentially describing that data set. And the one at the bottom, that is inferential, meaning that we're applying uh, probability or uh, you know, some statistical methods or modeling or whatever it is. That, so it's a little bit more uh, in-depth analysis to allow you to make decisions more accurately. Um, yeah. So. First thing that people, like at least uh, in, in, in you know, your first year stats course, they'll tell you that you should never make decisions based on descriptive data. 
Okay, so because that is simply just describing a small subset of the true population, like big picture data. So you only, when you collect a data set, you're only collecting a subset. And so you cannot make decisions based on just a, just summarizing that data and trying to make some informed decision. You gotta do another step further to try to, you know, to, to, to uh, try to make some, some inference out of that, okay? So in, for the rest of the presentation, I will, I will go through just some of these, uh, you know, these, uh, these, these areas, okay? Actually, this, this, on this site, I, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because uh, Dave already sort of did that exercise in the beginning, we're right now talking about what type of data are we collecting, and these are some of the, some of the data that I can think of, at least are the ones that I've been uh, working with. A lot of uh, GP, uh, GPS, you know, or IMU, which are the inertial movement units data, or uh, some, some of the company, like Catapult is what, you know, the, like the rugby sevens, the women's soccer team they're using, and a lot of professional teams are using, where you just have a little, uh, like an iPhone size, a unit where they put behind their neck, and they're able to track uh, the movements, or essentially like 80, I believe it's 80 to 90 variables at 100 times a second. So you can imagine like that's a lot of data, and for a soccer game, uh, you know, 11 athletes, about 90 minutes, you're getting about six million lines of data, you know, data from uh, just one of these units, right? Um, so that's a lot of data. So that's big data that we're we're talking about, and a lot of that, the companies are, the, these companies create these uh, metrics for you. However, you can get these raw data, and you can process it yourself to to get the data to 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 calculate the metrics that you're interested in within that sport, right? Um, obviously, we all know that there's performance data, and what that means is just a lot, you know, your testing, physiological, you know, SNC, whatever testings you're doing, and obviously the race results that you can, you can uh, scrape off online or from competitions or wherever, whatever you can get your hands on. Technical, tactical, a lot of, uh, that probably more uh, relates to the uh, team sports. They do a lot of uh, notational analysis, just tagging the events, how you know, how different uh, events, uh, when, it, when it happens, and they generate uh, box scores out of that. Um, a lot of times, like biomechanics, uh, we use uh, videos that you can tag on, like, different uh, knee angles or how that moves relative to certain uh, exercise that you're doing. Right? There's medical, nutrition, wellness is another, another big one that I think uh, a lot of the teams are getting on is trying to trying to monitor how ready our athletes are on a daily basis so that we can proactively adjust training to to you know to fit whatever uh, no, their their readiness state. Okay. So data processing. This is the part where I guess I'll I, I wouldn't say I'll disagree with Drew with uh you know the time that uh, that that I you know you spent like the most time consuming part for me it's not the analysis part that is time consuming it's actually I spend 80 90 percent of my time processing data um, one thing that you mentioned was just like let's say standardizing the format of the data and that a lot of times they have you know you get data from different sources from different people people have their own uh, way of you know, putting in like even the dates, just take dates for example. Some people don't even put it in a date format, they put it in as a text format, and so when you read them in, they just don't match, right? Or people put month, day, year, year, month. like all these different combinations that, well, you know, we have to somehow make sure they're standardized, okay? But more than that, it's just, uh, we're talking about like, for example, like I mentioned with the, with the GPS or IMU, when you're sampling at either you know a thousand times, you know a hundred times a second, or these little sensors I have on the table right here, these IMUs that I use on just recently now with, with the training camp upstairs uh, with the wheelchair rugby guys, those are sampled at 200 times a second, and 
you know, with a workout or with a test, whatever it is, you're getting like a couple hundred thousand lines of codes, and and they only come in as a uh, oh, is my time up? Oh, sweet. <laughs> So, so you you know, and we're getting data on just the raw acceleration and 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 the spin, the gyroscope data. We got to make some sense out of that. So we need to try to we need to calculate either speed, distance, angular velocity, and whatever it is that you 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 want from it from it, right? Then we can then use that information to later to uh to to try to monitor or or look at what the deficit is, and, you know, the strength and weaknesses of that individual. So trying to ind individualize the training, and so to to be able to comb through all that, that's where I find like I spend most of my time trying to determine, like trying to try, trying to process that data, and uh, a lot of the sports uh, specific metrics that we're you not know, talking about is is the training load, trying to trying to understand. For each individual uh, training session, how does it affect the the athletes? Depending on you know either what different type of training sessions, and then uh, the the intensity of the training session, right? We need to quantify that. Um, obviously, there's performance testing, so there's different physiological uh, race results. We have we can we have that as uh, as uh, our metrics. And lastly, it's the wellness is another big one that we're monitoring. I'm trying to understand, you know, the different, for example, the different uh, wellness questionnaires that uh, teams use are the, the hours of sleep, quality of sleep. Are you in pain? Are you sore? Are you, you know, are you motivated to train? And all these different questions, trying to understand what is uh, how ready each individual are for that day's training. Right, and we you know we, we can flag that early if, uh, if if there's something that pops up that we can adjust training accordingly. So monitoring. There are two main parts of two main areas of monitoring. There's internal and, and external. Okay. Externals are all these uh, metrics that you get from, like your watches, GPS, and all that. Something that we can measure, even power meters on a bike or whatever it is. All these external, uh, measurable, like uh, from technology that you can measure. And the internals are like, mainly physiological metrics, such as heart rate, and then you know, and sessional RPE, SRP is just how how hard that session felt. To that individual athletes for each training session or whatever that you know that that effort that they did. Um, another um, another like variation of the uh, the sessional RP uh, metric is called the T2 minute, and that's that incorporates uh, the different type of training sessions. So they put some weighting factors on, let's say, you know, weight lifting or running, cross training, all these different sessions because they don't always tax the individual the same. So they weigh them differently, and uh, and also they uh, weigh the uh, the different RP like different uh, RP uh, intensity differently because uh, yeah because like they currently the way you calculate your training load using the internal uh, method using RPE is just the length of training duration times the RPE. So if you did an hour, 60 minutes, times uh, you know if it's an easy session, which is RPE of two, for example, that's 120 units. So 60 times two, that's 120. Um, that's very different from uh, from uh, you know okay. That's uh, so currently they assume. Like you know, they, if you use that calculation, another uh, way of cal like calculating the intensity of uh, let's say something that's really hard, it will be nine RPE of nine, an hour of nine, no, an hour at intensity of nine will be 60 times nine, which is 540. Then uh, you're assuming that intensity band is linear, like you know every every uh, RPE increase is linear because like there's no weighting on it, but we know that. As intensity starts to increase, it just taxes your body 
way more. And so we should, you know, so that's why in the last, uh, in that last uh, quantification, they, they try to be more accurate by, by putting a weighting factor on that. And this is just an example of uh, just external loading. And this is uh, just from your Garmin watch. It's just, you know, it provides you with a whole bunch of different uh, metrics with, obviously there's the elevation, there's uh, speed, this is running, this is running exercise, so there's speed, there's heart rate, obviously they, they give you all these different advanced metrics where they have like running dynamics or there's contact time, there's the uh, how even, like your cadence, for example. Um, what else do they, do they have? Oh, different oscillation and then those are the main, you know, metrics, but within even just the sub-metrics that there's, you know, you can have each one of these uh, metrics for each lap or each uh, whatever, you know, lap segment, right? Um, so these are, uh, th this is just from Garmin. These are the, from Catapult. This is what we, what the women's uh, Rugby 7s and uh, soccer uses. They, uh, they have, a, they, they, these, they have a lot more, you know, variable being calculated here. Like I was saying, it's like somewhere around 90 variables. You know, you have like different speed or intensity at different zones. Like zone one probably you know, means it's easy, zone two, zone three, zone four, and you can set those different zone bands as well. And they're, you know, uh, and so they have the, the different average speed, max speed, and, uh, you know, and so there's just tons and tons of like, variables in there. And a lot of times it can be overwhelming to, to uh, coaches to, to, to look at that. And so, so one way that we help in terms of, you know, as a data analyst, we help, is trying to help them boil it down to um, just the metrics that's really important to the coaches so that they don't have to look at all 88 variables and trying to decipher it out of that, right? Internal training load, like I was describing earlier, currently it's just time, duration of the exercise times the, uh, times the intensity. So, if you're, you know, if you're doing 100 minutes at very, very easy of RPE of one, that's 100 units, which is not the same as when you're doing uh, 10 minutes at RPE of 10. Also, it's 100 units, right? So, it, with this kind of uh, calculation, the, the, the really simple way of calculating just time and RPE, we can see the flaw of 100 minutes times RPE of one equals 100 does not equal to 10 minutes at maximum effort. We know 10 minutes at maximum effort will take you many, like, few days to recover. Meanwhile, you know, 100 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes at RPE of one, for, for an endurance athlete, we're well trained, you could probably recover that in, within a day, right? So it's not very different, but however, from just a calculation standpoint, they look the same because both says 100 minutes. Hence, there is the, uh, the second method, the T2 minutes, which they weigh that differently. And, uh, and I won't go into too much detail on how they calculate it, but they weigh the actual modality of exercise, and also they weigh the RPE mainly based on, uh, there, there are many ways that you can weigh the RPE based on either physiological markers like lactate. You know, obviously at RPE of 10, your lactate is going to be very, very high compared, when, compared to when you're a really, really easy RPE of one, your lactate is probably close to two or you know, one to two, somewhere around there. And so they use that as a multiplier. But there, there are other ways that you can do that as well to, to really weigh the high intensity uh, RPE just to have it, you know, to show, to really show the training load that way. And uh, this uh, graph also just shows a quick way to just like Spot. What is uh, what is uh, when somebody is outside of this sweet zone? Because you don't want to be looking, you know, be, especially when you're monitoring. And I, I know a lot of you guys are monitoring multi, many athletes, 20, 30, 40, whatever it is, that you want to have a way that you can quickly just spot something very quickly, rather than having to go through every one like training load every day to and, and trying to figure out what is out of norm, right? And so 
one way is to use this, uh, you know, there are many ways, but one quick way that you can do is what's called the acute training, uh, acute chronic work ratio. And that's, uh, that method came, came out from one, you know, Tim Gabbard, one studies from his, uh, I think, Australian football. And, the, and it's being widely used currently where they've shown that anything between 0 0.8 to 1.2 1 to 1.3 is a sweet spot. And when, uh, so what that means is what they, they take the ratio between acute training load and chronic training load. So acute training load is defined by the average of the last past seven days of the training load. So again, training load is defined as the easy, no, the really simple format is just like calculating RPE times time, right? So that is just your, that session training load. And if you have multiple sessions that day, you just add them up, that is your daily training load. And so if you want to calculate the acute training load, that would just be the average of the past seven days, of seven days of training load. And uh, the chronic training load would just be the average of the past uh, 21 days. Okay, so you just take the ratio of that, and the ratio, if it's between 0.8 to 1.7, or uh, 1.3, that is con considered sweet spot, and that means that's where you, ideally where you want your athletes to be, you know, your training load to be. Anything higher and higher than that, then um, you can create, this is done in, the, in actually in Excel. So you can create it like a, like a macro where uh, it will just flash red or whatever color to show that this uh, person is out of range. Anything over 1.3, it's been shown that you know, people are more prone to, let's say, overtraining or potentially uh, getting injured, right? And so if you see that on, you know, on your training load, maybe, you know, you, know it, it sh you shouldn't be alarmed after like one you know, in incident or one day, but however, if you see multiple days that your training load is above 1.3, which is, if it's not, especially if it's not by design, sometimes if you design your training uh, program to overload them, then it's okay, obviously, because you, you're planning to have a recovery phase after that. But, but a lot of times, you don't, you know, you can design a training schedule a certain way, but because of the stresses from, uh, you know, for the athletes from, you know, life stress, school stress, work stress, whatever stress they experience at home, a seemingly easy or, you know, moderate workout of, you know, which you plan to be like in an RPE of three could easily be an RPE of, of five or six or seven, whatever that may be, and that will increase that training, you know, load, right? And so that's one quick way that you can track that, right? And so with that, so if you have few days that you can, you know, the color of your, you know, cell pops up red or whatever it is, then you can see, then, then you can maybe start paying attention and adjust your training schedule proactively. Okay, so that's the training low part. And, um, Next, it will be the uh, wellness wellness uh, questionnaire, and like I, like I was uh, like I explained before, there are different questions that you would you know people generally ask, or different team ask, uh, and they're similar. And this is adopted from a uh, Hooper's McKinnon uh, training uh, questionnaire, and uh, generally the scale for these questionnaires are from one to seven or one to ten, depending on the team. Um, one is real, generally means it's bad. Ten being the ten, ten being good, seven being good. So you got to make sure, you know, trying to make sure that 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 is, you're standardizing that. You don't want to put the numbers up and down for different questionnaires. You want to make sure that being consistent with uh, you know with these uh, numbers. And um, overall wellness score is just a sum of these numbers. So every day you just add them up. And that would that would be your overall wellness score. Um, and so, to one good way to one way that a lot, like most people are using or doing right now, and you know, especially in the national team, a lot of them are uh, the way they monitor is just uh, creating, calculating the Z score, and then just plotting it, 
And so what that score will tell you is like if you're one standard deviation away from your normal, it will just pop up. It just alarm you that this person is feeling, you no know, worse than you no know, one standard deviation worse than they they normally feel. And uh, and the further away from normal, obviously, then uh, the the so what, the more negative it is, the, the the worse they're feeling, right? So so like for in this example, we can see that the few spots, few uh, days that this person is feeling pretty bad from the uh, from the highlighted uh, cells over there. And so I you know in this case, I wouldn't worry too much about that first cell because it's just one day. Yeah. But at the bottom, you can see that there are many, many days now now of continuing showing high, uh, you know, below average uh, wellness. That's when, that's when I would go, you could go in and start looking without any highlighted cells, and you can pretty much you know, know that they're within the right range. You don't have to really look into it too much. However, if there are multiple cells that, that pop up uh, alarms, and then maybe that, those are the ones that you can uh, focus on and understand why that is happening. A lot of times, we see data, maybe in the final exams or whatever, when you're doing these more uh, young students, you see data that we can So wellness is calculated at the best score. And uh, that score is just the average minus uh, well, the daily number minus the average divided by standard deviation. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can usually I just roll it for a, a month. Right? Because you you don't want to roll it for like a whole year because like then you can't really capture what they what they've done in the last uh, Last um, month, right? Like, yeah, you want to make sure that you're 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 uh, capturing the whole like month of uh, wellness rather than just like a full year, right? Because like, yeah, like if you capture it for the month, then uh, you're actually capturing also the different different period of their training cycle, right? And uh, so so that's that's how I generally uh, calculate my uh, Z score, the average of the month. So now we have accurate way of yep. Good. Seven. The higher the number, the better it is. Yeah. At least for this. At least uh, for. That's right. Exactly. So the bigger the number, the that means it's the better it is. Yeah. So if it's pain, ten means like there's no pain. Except for sickness, obviously, uh, it's only it's out of scale one to three. One being sick, two not too good, not not well, and three is uh, good. So again, keeping consistency with bigger number means good. Okay. So now with all these you no know, way of monitoring that you know, especially trying to be very accurate in trying to monitor uh, different either training load or wellness. We're coming to the point where we want to report it, so that we can make you know decisions on on that, right? Or you know, yeah, and that's that's ultimately the goal is we collect data, we analyze it, we want to report it so that we can make some decisions on, on it to, to inform us to make uh to, for you know to inform inform us for the next step or to do, take some action on it. And these are again, these are just like some of the uh, reporting that. Teams are using right now. Uh, there's the wellness, and you know, these are this is where uh, you know they, there's a breakdown into different modality of uh, training sessions. Um, so yeah, so these are just as you can see there. Uh, these 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 reporting are very similar to uh, you know just different, just giving you guys like a different uh, 
visual on what the, the different recording format looks like. But the two big questions to me when I look at those uh, reports is that can you really answer these two questions when you when you look at a report like that? And that to me is like that. I was like that I want to really try to provoke most of you guys, and all of you guys to think about it. When you look at a report or any chart or any graph, can you really answer these two questions? One is uh, what is the minimum change that's uh, that's important to whatever metrics you're measuring. And second is how sure are you of that change? And by I want to I'll go back to that. How do I understand the next one here? This is just a very simple descriptive um, figure or a bar graph of uh, just a jump tower, right? If you look at that, this is a historic graph of just one person or bar graph of just one person. Can you answer those two questions? What is the minimum? threshold of that change and how sure are you of that change? Can you answer that? Probably not, right? How, how, by, by looking at that, you know, you, without doing much, you know, any more in-depth calculation or, you know, trying to, trying to understand the, the minimum change, you will never know, right? And you can uh, imagine that most of our reports, if not, I would say 99% of our reports, are generated this way. It's just there's a there's a, you know an average of something either a bar graph or a line graph or whatever it is. So they just call it the average, and there, and um, and we you know and a lot of times we try to make decisions on that, right? We we look at the trends or we look at the change and it's like oh okay this uh, month or this test is better than the last test. Oh great, we made an improvement, right? And uh, but what, but what is the uh, the threshold on that? Like, however, if you look at this, this is a, you know a, a more of a inferential way of reporting where the dot means the probability of those uh, change happening, and those dots are all, will only appear if they have passed a certain threshold in terms of smallest worthwhile change then the dots would appear. If not, that means the change doesn't mean anything. It's just within the daily variance, right? So as you can see, that for a, quick, uh, for a coach to be able to see something and make decision very quickly, just trying to imagine, you know, compare the two different graphs. One is this, a descriptive um, reporting, and asking you to try to tell me which one of these uh, changes are real and how you know and what how sure are you compared to this right away you can tell me the one with the dots are the important ones and they pass the threshold test and second you can tell how like what you know what percent what probability how sure you are of the change so in this case one dot means you're 75 to 85 percent sure two dots means you're 85 to 95% sure, and three dots means you're over 95% sure that that change happened. All the rest is below 75, so that means so that means a lot of that could happen by luck, right? And you don't want to base on your decision based on luck, right? So so I wanted to, this is like a comparison that I want you guys to to really think about, you know, going forward. So there are two main areas, like two main disciplines in uh, in stats, as I have described a few times now. There's the descriptive, and there's the inferential. Descriptive is again, we're just summarizing whatever the data that you're collecting, and inferential is we're using different techniques to try to make to allow us to make predictions or forecasting or you know trying to get probability of that event happening. And uh, so in descriptive, a lot of times we're collecting data. And what we're doing is trying to, we, we, we obviously cannot collect data on the whole population size, right? And so we're, we're collecting a small sample. And then 
in descriptive, we're just describing that sample. That's all we're doing. If you haven't done any testing on it, like statistical testing, and you want to infer onto the whole population, then as you can see, that's, there's going to be flaws in doing that. That's why you, you will need to do further testing to make, to make that into an inferential test. Okay, and there are several techniques. I won't, I won't go into it, but I know just to highlight that. So in a descriptive report, what, you know, what can you say about them when you, when you generate a report like that? For example, the, the chart before, we, where we were just showing an average of something. What you can really say in that instance is just that it, these are just average values. But you need more to understand, you need more information to understand the data better. That's the only thing you can say. You can't say anything more than that. Okay, so, so you, I want you guys to be cautious of that. If you just present an average of something, that's all you can say. That's just the average. You can't even say that, oh, there's potential trend or it's whatever it is. You can't say that because you haven't done any testing further to allow you to say things like that. Next, sometimes, you know, a lot of times we can, some people will put in like standard deviation on it, which is better. And that allows you to say more about the, the, the different spread of the data. But again, you don't know if those changes are, are significant or that, or, or not, right? These again are just telling you about that data set, it's just a summary of that data set, okay? And then there are other ways that, you know, there are other forms of, of reporting a descriptive data. And these are different things that you can say about it. Even, even the last, last thing where, you know, it's about small workload change, okay? You, you can calculate a threshold and you can see that your, for example, your performance test is past this threshold. But still, you have not tested it. To, to, to know if this is significant or not, okay? So these are, again, these are, so, but again, as the, as the method goes down on this table, you're getting better and better at, you know, creating these, uh, these descriptive report more, uh, more accurate to allow you to, again, dig deeper into this, uh, to, to allow you, to, to help you with making decisions better, right? So, what can we do to go into, to, to uh, change that descriptive report into inferential report? And the two main things that you can do, which addresses those two questions, is one, calculate what is the threshold, the minimum threshold that you need in order to, to, uh, to, to um, get over this performance, you know, to make that change in, to, to see the change in performance, right? And you, so, and then secondly, you want to understand what is the probability of that change happening, okay? And to calculate the small work, worthwhile change, there are many things that's involved. There's our technical measurement error, which means like, you know, when you use certain, um, let's say for Garmin GPS, there's a plus minus 2% error, and that's, that's probably like the, the, the most accurate uh, GPS out that any, any company will, can make. Just because you're getting the data from the satellite, like you're just gonna get that kind of error. It's a, between one and a half to 2%. And so you have to understand that. So if let's say your, your improvement is less than 1%, that's easily within just the error of the measurement. So you can't say that, oh, yeah, I made a 1% improvement. You can't even say that because your measurement is more than, you know, 1.5%. So that could easily be just noise, right? Um, same thing with um, biological variance. If I am running, if I tell you to run, let's say, you know, 100 meters every, uh, you know, the next, every other day for the next, uh, next week, you run like 300 meters time trial or, you no know, a performance test, you're not gonna get the exact same time, like, I don't know, 11.14. You're just not gonna get the exact same time. There's gonna be a variance, right? And so you have to be able to quantify those variants so that if the variance says uh, it's rough, you, you're gonna be running between, you know, the variance is about 0.05, and if your improvement is, you know, 0.01, you 
that's your again your improvement is still within the noise that you, you shouldn't read too much into that. However, if you are one second faster, then you're past that threshold. Then we got to think. Then we can look into look at it now. Look into deeper about you know, what you know, what is the probability that one second improvement you know how you know, can happen, right? Is it like 25% by chance and 75% you're sure, or is it more or less? You no, know, we you know it's in order for you. When we can answer that, then that gives you a lot more credibility and, and, and just confidence in uh, interpreting that data, right? So this is just one of the uh, example of the inferential uh, report. This middle grayed out area is the small smallest worthwhile change. It's, that's the threshold. Okay. These different lines over there, it just means, uh, you know, the first line just means it's small effect, medium effect, large effect, and extremely large effect. Okay. So just to, to give you some context. So if a change is within this region right here, it just means it's a small change. With this change here, it's a large change. And anything, any point that lies outside of that would be very large change. And again, with the asterisk on top of these uh, different points, it just means a different probability of that event or that change happening. Okay. And so this is just an example of uh, different individuals. Imagine these lines are these points are different athletes being. Uh, Tested on this one one metrics, it's aer uh, aerobic threshold pace, and that's just their improvement from their you know from this test to the last test. Okay, and you can see as you can see this, I guess for this test, everyone improved in different ways. You can also look you know plot this and look at it from a individual historic, you know figure, where whatever this metric can't maybe this grayed out area here again is just the threshold the minimum threshold anything inside that threshold like this point in there or like this point in there that is just noise it doesn't even pass the noise test so anything any points in there is within the noise we shouldn't be worried about it too much but even with the points that's outside of the uh, Outside of these uh, these graded area, we have different certainties, right? With this different certain different uh, probability of that event happening, and uh, and that's a quick way for you to look at like a historic data of one individual and pick out when or you know when this person improved or decrease in performance or whatever or make you know a, a significant change, and you can overlay that. Uh, with let's say training load, then you can look. You can actually evaluate your, uh, your the block of training affecting certain metrics that you're interested in, right? This is another um, report on Anthro, and this is being used now. So we're currently at CSI Pacific, currently converting a lot of our uh, reporting from. From a descriptive to inferential, and this is physiology has done a, you know, a spearheading the the uh, the project by converting all their anthro into from from uh, descriptive into inferential, and this is the result of that project that uh, every graph now is inferential. So this, you know, as you can see, again, these are the dots there shows that there is a significant change, and how sure we are. Of that change for all these different metrics. So, a lot of times when you're looking, when you're tracking a whole bunch of metrics, you a lot of times you're only interested in whatever that you're measuring on a current day of testing compared to whatever you know uh, the last testing, right? So, this is a nice one to show that of your just a quick summary of. Today's test 
of all the different metrics compared to your, your last test, right? And so here in this case, we have five different you know, variables that we're we're monitoring, and you know, and these are like again being consistent with the theme here. Inferential report always shows that there is a min minimum threshold, a smallest worthwhile change that you, you know, to show you where is that band that threshold is. And also the asterisk to show you what, how sure you are of the change. And again, in this, uh, I guess in this metrics, every, every metric can prove. But a lot of times, like if you have multiple metrics and you want to just pick out which ones are the, mo are the one that significantly increase, all you have to look at is the one that's that has the asterisk on it. Then you can pick. You, then you don't have to. You don't have to sift through all these different metrics. You can just pick out the one quickly of what metrics improve, right? And that so this not only provides context for the coaches, but it just it really speeds up on how coaches can interpret data very quickly with accuracy. So just a recap. Um, of that flowchart, that you know, that workflow, where I talked, we talked about a little bit about the data, different type of data collection, and uh, also just different processing. And I hope that with uh, you know, and we talked also talked about the the accuracy in monitoring the different uh, data, like training load or wellness, because if you if those metrics are not accurate, then you're feeding in to a report with a with a faulty like data, then your 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 report or, or all your analysis is going to be compromised, right? So so that's why like it's important to make sure that when we're measuring something, we got to make sure that we're measuring whatever like our objective properly, right? And lastly, is I hope that I provoke you guys to think. A little bit deeper into more than just a descriptive, just taking an average, taking the standard deviation in a, uh, in, a, in our normal descriptive reporting. But now, able to you know, able to ask those questions, like deeper questions, or even want to know a little bit more about are those past a certain threshold, and how sure are we of those changes, right? And because those are really, really important questions that we need to ask. Otherwise, a lot of your changes could be just by luck, right? So, next thing. Good. Next thing. So, so you're saying that based on data that shows that they're not feeling well, for example, but they they look like they're okay. Um, well, I think a lot of that is like I I'll be you know as much of a data geek I am. I am the first one to tell you that I will not base everything like data does not tell you everything, right? Like there's no way that we can capture everything about everybody and measure everything there's no way like no no modeling is perfect right and so a lot of so we can use these use the analysis use the use the results to help support us to make right decisions but we can't use them we can't just 100 percent base on that without thinking and just say oh data says this for sure you're this like that i don't think that's the right way to use uh data i think a lot of that has to come from like the intuition as well, and that's where art of coaching is, right? Know how to use data to help support your, you know, your decision. It, you don't just base 100% on the data because there's no no model in the world is perfect, and that can capture everything about, you know, which I think our, our humans just too complex for anybody to model that perfectly. Really long history of 
Um, well, there are a lot of uh, a lot of different things that we can do. Like really, uh, I think that's based on the questions that you guys are interested in, right? Um, and that's gen generally what like what we do from uh, the CSI standpoint is like we we can obviously help you trying to dis to, to, to determine what is your true need, right? Because a lot of times that you may not have the expertise to understand what are the specific metrics that you need to monitor or calculate or track for a certain thing that you want to look at, right? So that is extremely important, right? Because if you're not calculating the right metric to monitor whatever you are interested in, then you, you may not be really tracking the right thing. So that, I think that will be the number one step is for, you know, that's one of the services that we can help you guys is trying to determine that for you. And once we can determine that, then of course then you can go out and try to collect that data for a period of time. Then again, the next phase is to come back to let's look at, let's explore this data. Drew has done a great job in looking at correlation and looking at these, you know, those graphs, like summarizing the graph. Based on that summary, there is potential of a positive trend, negative trend, whatever it may be. There is your question. Now we can go deeper into investigating, are those trends real, right? That's where the exploratory uh, analysis are very important, right? So these descriptive uh, data, like descriptive analysis, they're extremely important. I'm not saying they're not, but it's just that we can make this, it, it allows us to ask deeper questions when you see some potential pattern. And so it's the same thing here. Once you, once you guys you know, collect the data, you will see a pattern, whatever it is, and you can come back to us and we can help you try to answer some more you know, in-depth burning questions that you have from uh, exploring those data that you collected. Right? And another thing I will say is, let's say, let's create the inferential reports. Something that is very quick and simple, but for you, it's very impactful because you can immediately see the change from test to test, for example, or from day to day uh, like wellness variance between in the, in our individual responses, things like that. Right? So, I mean, there, there are also more, uh, more in depth, like analytic work that we can do, but in terms of just low hanging fruit. There's just there's so many things that we can do right now that that could really just impact like your impact the PSO in, in terms of like monitoring tracking just a lot of people at once right you, we don't need a, a lot of work to do that right? it's like it's a quick quick thing but it's going to impact you guys quite a bit. So you kind of saw the whole gamut of where you know we can take sort of data analytics and you know I think the one thing that I'll reflect on in in a lot of this conversation is you know how many degrees of separation do we have from the athletes and when you think about yourself and you're the one that maybe is producing the targeted list or you know you're the technical director what impacts are you having and of course you know, we have that effect as well when largely in athlete services, we may be two or three degrees separated from the athletes. And when I look at performance analysis, it's always been a case where, you know, there's huge value to what performance analysis can bring. And I think, you know, when people looked at performance analysis five, six years ago, it's like, oh, well, I got somebody that can hold a video camera, take some video. So it was more about the data collection. And what I like about where Ming's gone with it is, no, we've got to really decide whether the data that we're collecting is worth anything and is it actually making the changes that we can have. And at the very top end, when that performance curve is becoming so close to whatever that ceiling of potential is, you pretty much need to know that 
in order to potentially win medals or have a competitive advantage against your, your opponents. So just wanted to finish it off with a couple of questions. If I can go the right way on this. Yeah. These were the questions that we asked at the beginning. So is what I am measuring telling me what I need to know? What can I start, stop, continue to measure in my sport? What are some of the strategies to effectively analyze the data so that it is meaningful for coaches and athletes? And of course, that to me, I think is a pretty cool part because that's where I see some of this data being used as augmented feedback. How do we use the data to inform the athlete? Well, are you really improving? You know, and how many times do we actually sit down and actually can show an athlete whether they are improving or not? And the fact is, is that improvement a real improvement or not an improvement? And it comes back to just the way that we're able to track some of that. And how do we know that monitoring interventions are having an impact on athlete performance? Um, you know, a lot of what Ming talked about from a training load perspective, I would say just looking at some of the papers that have come out around this whole idea of monitoring training load has really taken off probably last four or five years. So scientists are starting to dive a little bit deeper on it. Um, but one of the things that, that sort of came to my mind, we had a synchronized swimming coach in our advanced coaching diploma. And she, you know, as, as everybody's trying to develop their annual training plan, we always say, well, it's good to quantify your training plan. Of course, it's a very theoretical thing because it's on a week-by-week -week basis. And you got all these lines and graphs. One line's supposed to tell you what the volume of work is, and one line's supposed to tell you the intensity. And then if you're really cool, you can get an algorithm and give you a little load, right? And from a theoretical standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, I don't knock that because I think it's good for coaches to go through that to try and just get a sense of what does that look like over the year. But where the rubber really hits the road is if you can take that static sort of model and say, well, do I actually, can I make it more dynamic? Can I actually track this stuff? And I think that that's where a lot of this stuff is going. So the analogy behind the, the synchro is we talked, so how many hours do you have in a training week? So do you think th synchro, where are they training? In a swimming pool. How many hours do they typically get? The same number of hours every single week, right? So they're, they're training 18 hours a week. That's how many hours they have in their training program. But the interesting part was that within each of those practice sessions during the week, they're always doing different things. So the, the way that we were looking at trying to quantify that is they had four different things they do, synchro, they do dry land training, they do technical training in the water, they do swimming for fitness, and they do choreographed routines. Four simple things. And the point would be is, well, can we determine what a sessional intensity is of those four different things? So it's interesting getting the idea. What we didn't get to was, could we actually measure what that sessional is? And it would be great to look at that. But I think there's some you know, great ways that you can start taking some of this information and working with your coaches or working yourself as a coach. Now, we're finishing off a bit early, which is great because you can always get back in the traffic from Richmond. Uh, but I'm not going to let you leave until you write those questions down. What do you want from us? So whether it's on Drew's situation or even from some support, uh, because that's the one thing is we want to have this session have some meaning. Candace takes, we take this session, we post them on the website so people can come back to these sessions and see. So when you leave, put a post-it note by the door. We're going to collect them so that we can start following up. And you can even put your, yeah, I'm Chris from, uh, you know, BC Athletics and, and, and I need a lot of help. <laughs> First of all, I need more time in my day, 
<laughs> no. But seriously, what do you what what are you curious about? What are your questions when it comes to data analysis? And the last one I'll just point out there is is around monitoring, because I've talked to a number of PSOs of, around, well, how do we even just start doing the monitoring? And uh, Ming, as you know, there's tons of different uh, apps out there you could send out to your players and things like that. Um, you know, and it's almost a bit of a Wild West show. So we use um, Smartabase, and, uh, you know, certainly I've talked to our staff about being able to deploy some of that monitoring so that maybe it can be easy, easily accessible for PSO. You know, why can't we take some of this daily wellness monitoring and try it through uh, some other means? Okay, so let's wrap it up there. Candice, thank you very much for uh, putting this together. Drew, uh, great job in presenting the information that we have and hopefully taking a deeper dive into some of the information we have based on your questions. And Ming, finishing off with the overall kind of importance behind doing this analysis. So thanks very much, and we'll leave it there. Candace.